I left uh, in 67, 68 when I was a kid. Um, but then we returned. My parents sent me back thinking they were going to return to the U.S. And I stayed with my aunt and uncle around 1973. T-Rex was playing and Zeppelin. And, uh, Deep Purple was a huge band in Greece that year. So I remember the first two albums I bought, Deep Purple Machine Head and uh, Uriah Heep, Demons and Wizards. And then I was going to Greek high school. Uh, I lived in Zografu, and uh, and I remember they made such an impression on me when I went to the United States, I had gotten to American comic books and all that stuff. So that artwork that Roger Dean did for uh, Demons and Wizards was a huge impression on me. The professor was walking up at Donald, he was physics class. It was quoting today's lesson. And instead of writing notes, you know, it was all boys' school at the time. You know, they had girls' schools and boys' schools that were separate, right? So I don't know. I remember. I started drawing the cover, the wizard, with pencil on the desk. And I got completely absorbed in it. So 20 minutes into the class, I had drawn the whole record cover of Demons and Wizards on the desk. And all of a sudden, got really quiet. And I realized that you know, nobody was talking and I stop, I look up and, you know, there's the professor looking at me, you know, he says, uh, in Greek, he says, I come in on a zograph with a better. What do you mean? Hey, it looks like we have a Greek, we have a, an artist in our midst, <laughs> you know, and all the artists. So I had to stay after school. I had to wash every desk. There was about 40 of them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was my punishment. So when I met Mick Box, Uriah Heap, and then we started working. I said to Mick, you owe me. Mick goes, why? I said, because I suffer from my art for you. <laughs> the band usually approaches me. Somebody in the band um, is a fan of my work or likes what I do. Uh, I'm brought in very early into the process and I get, um, we sit down, we tend to listen to the music, we discuss ideas, the approach, and that's how things come about. That's how it worked with Deep Purple, that's how it worked with Uriah Heep, that's how it worked with King Crimson, um, even Fate's Warning. Because what I see, what I do is a perfect fusion of art and music, right? Uh, and that's really the exciting part for me. It's sitting down with a musician that I like, or a band that I like, and the guy says, plays me this piece of music. and says, hey man, like, you know, what does this make you think about? How, what, what are the things? And I said, how do you see this? And I listened to the music and I said, well, you know, this is what I see when I hear this. And I've been liking that for a lot of times. The guy goes, wow, that's really, that's really cool. That's really cool that my music makes you think like that. I like that. Let's present it this way. Um, so I sort of see my, the music as a soundtrack to my art, like a movie. And vice versa, the band sees the music, uh, the art, as an interpretation of what they're playing. But there's great albums that have lousy record covers. I mean, let's face it, but it still doesn't change the fact that they're beautiful, great albums. When it's perfect, when it combines, then it's a very strong thing for the fans. It's a very strong concept. And the examples I can give you is Derek Riggs with Iron Maiden. Would Iron Maiden be any less better if it wasn't for Derek's art? No. When you combine that great music and the visual of Derek Riggs or the with Eddie that he created, that art of his, very potent concept. Or, or the band Yes with Roger Dean. Yes music would have been any less, no, but when you listen to Yes and then you look at the way Roger Dean interprets their music and his art, all of a sudden it opens up all these worlds, all these ideas and gives the band a look, an image. Uh, Storm Thurgensen with Pink Floyd the artwork that he's done for Pink Floyd or uh, Hugh Sign with Rush. When you have that great pairing, I think it'd be incredibly effective, incredibly effective.
<laughs> there are a few that stand out, I guess. I think I, 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 I like the way Wake the Sleeper came out because it was the first album that Uriah Heap had done in 10 years. And Mick wanted to sort of restart the look of Uriah Heap. And it was a challenge, especially when I had people like Roger Dean who had done their previous covers and stuff like that. Uh, Fate's Warning, Awaken the Guardian is a really, really popular piece of art of mine. I sell a lot of prints of that, a lot of artwork. Um, the Ulmer Brothers album cover, Where It All Begins, um, is that's one of their strongest, most famous pieces. They used it for backdrops, T-shirts, posters, you know, um, so that has its own um, style. So I guess they're just different ones from different styles. You know, there's no one particular that I would say is the best that I did because I'm always uh, kind of looking for the next one, you know, <laughs> which one I'm going to do, you know. I think a good record cover represents the band properly, but also at the same time, it sets a mood for the fans. It, it, it helps identify who they are. And, and it makes the band, it, it becomes a good merchandisable symbol. One of the strongest ones, examples I can give you is Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. You know, when Storm came up with that idea, and he showed it to the band. It was based on the fact of their light show. You know, they had an amazing light show at the time, Pink Floyd. But also the way they interpreted the idea. I mean, if, if you told somebody, okay, what's the title of the album, Dark Side of the Moon? Most people would come up with some obvious ideas. There'd probably be a shot of the moon. There'll be this, there'll be that. The way Storm interpreted a prism, and you know the symbol and all that. It was just such a different idea, but from a marketing point, it was incredible because when he showed back in those days, when they showed the record cover to EMI, and EMI said, "Oh, well, that's a nice one. I like. It. Okay, great. So, where's the name of the band going to go up here? And we're going to put the title over here." They're like, "No, that's it. Black cover, prison." And they had a meltdown. They're like, are you out of your mind? We're going to put on an album that doesn't have the name of the band on it, whatever. I mean, you know, you look at now something like Apple computers, or, you know, Apple, you don't have, to, they don't have to say Apple. They just show you a symbol. He was so ahead of his time, but he got it. And in the years that followed, of course, it was an amazing album for Pink Floyd, but it has become the most identifiable symbol of all time. I mean, anywhere you go around the world, on the side of on t-shirts, on the side of vans, on motorcycles, and that you see that prism and you go, oh, Pink Floyd. And I mean, it's it's a phenomenon, it becomes. That's a successful record cover. first record covers were in the 80s and we were switching at that time from vinyl to cd and i remember a lot of people going well that's the end of record covers people want cds now who cares it's only you know it, what the point that they miss is what designers like me are brought to do is create a look for the band the palette changes but the mission is the same mick rock is a really good friend of mine and Mick has done the record covers for Queen, David Bowie, you know, he's a lot older than I, he was very famous in the 70s, you know, the Queen 2 cover and so on. And he said to me, you know, there will always be a job for me and you as long as rock and roll people are ugly. Iron Maiden was Iron Maiden, but Derek Riggs created a look for them. It didn't matter if he did it back in the days of vinyl or if he does it now, because you're brought aboard to present the band. So there's the logo designs. There's the way they're market. Merchandising is very big now, right? Because the bands are playing. Yeah, we don't sell physical, but, but merch is huge. Um, so the priorities have changed. When I take a meeting with the band, the first word out of the managers is, 
what kind of merchandising can we design? What can you come up with for us? So we can sell t-shirts because that's where the money is for them, is touring and t-shirt design. You know, in 1985, uh, I was working on a project and I did a, a band called Heaven and the manager of the band was Paul O'Neill, which I was very good friends with at the time. And Paul later switched the band. It became Sabotage and then it became the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. But it, but that band was signed to Columbia. It was a big band and I got paid and I was doing well. And then this, these small bunch of guys showed up with no money and broke. But one of them was Greek, which I liked. It was Jim Matthias and it was Fate's Warning and I did it. And, you know, Fate's Warning tried to be one of the greatest bands around the years that came later, you know? Uh, so you never know sometimes, you know? So you cannot, in music, you, you know, you have to follow your instincts. Sometimes you can't just do it just for the money or just for the, for the fame, you know?